It's approved and called Sputnik V. Russia says it's the first vaccine against COVID-19. But many governments are skeptical. So were Russian scientists pressure to cut corners? And is there significance to the timing of the announcement? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbarra. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, there's been a global race to find a vaccine. But scientists are worried some countries may be rushing the process and compromising safety. Earlier this week, Russian President Vladimir Putin said his country has approved the world's first coronavirus vaccine. Putin says it shows what he called sustainable immunity against the virus, adding his own daughter was inoculated. But scientists in Russia and abroad are skeptical about its effectiveness. They say offering it to the public before the important final stage of testing could pose serious problems. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, this report from Charlie Angela. It's a race everyone wants to win, but rushing it could prove fatal. President Putin says Russia has approved a vaccine against COVID-19 despite not completing crucial phase three clinical trials. Today in the morning, the first vaccine against the new coronavirus infection was registered, although I know it works fairly effectively, forms stable immunity, and I repeat, it has gone through all the necessary checks. Dubbed Sputnik V after the first satellite in space, the vaccine has only been tested on 138 people, one of them Putin's daughter. Based on a proven vaccine against adenovirus, the common cold, this vaccine allegedly gives immunity against COVID-19 for two years. But the results of the limited trials have yet to be made public. Coronavirus has ripped through Russia. It has the fourth highest number of cases in the world. The health ministry says doctors and teachers will receive the first doses before a mass vaccination program starts in January. 20 countries have rushed to pre-order over a billion doses, according to Moscow. But the World Health Organization says the vaccine has not got their stamp of approval yet. We are in a close contact with the Russian health authorities and discussions are ongoing with respect to possible WHO pre-qualification of the vaccine, but again, pre-qualification of any vaccine includes the rigorous review and assessment of all required safety and efficacy data. And the scientific community say the speed of development and lack of transparency is causing them concern. We have no idea whether even the claims that are being made about the safety and the immune response of this virus are true or not. I hope they're true. You know, once there is a safe and effective vaccine, personally, I don't care where it comes from. We need to work together to get this to everybody around the world. Um, one of the things that I worry about is that, you know, if this is really more about, you know, sort of geopolitics and being able to claim victory. It may put pressure on other countries to cut corners on safety and effectiveness as well. And that could put us all in danger. Until the WHO gives the vaccine the green light, this is not a race Russia can claim to have won. Charlie Angela, Al Jazeera. Let's bring in our panel. In Moscow, we have Maria Lipman, Senior Associate at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. Ilan Kester, Derek Gatherer, virologist and lecturer at the Lancaster University. Also in Moscow, Konstantin Severinov, professor at the Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology and head of the laboratory at Waxman Institute for Microbiology at Rutgers University. Welcome to you all. Maria, in an ideal world, when someone announces that a vaccine for COVID-19 is ready to use should generate massive momentum and optimism. What we've seen is the opposite, skepticism all over the world. Why do you think so? 
Well, apparently, and what uh, so many experts and laymen seem to agree, that uh, this vaccine has not been tested enough, that the results of the testing uh, conducted so far have been insufficient and certainly inconclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, seems that important uh, uh, phases of the testing have been skipped. And uh, what uh, is so far, what can be uh, reported as a scientific success is used for political purposes, for taking pride and uh, uh, proving to the world that Russia has a superiority in science. Mm -hmm. Derek, what is the problem here, the problem number one? Is it because the Russians have not shared any of the data about phase one and phase two with the scientific community? It would be really helpful if we had that data. We know virtually nothing at all uh, about this vaccine other than that it's uh, based on the chimpanzee adenovirus platform. It's the, the CHAD platform, which is also the basis for the CHAD Ox vaccine, which is the Oxford vaccine, so that we would assume that it works in more or less the same way. Um, as the Oxford vaccine. But apart from that, we know very little at all. Um, it's apparently been through phase one and uh, phase two clinical trials, and we're about to get um, a phase three trial starting now. Um, that, that means that it's not really much further down the pipeline than several other vaccine projects. Mm -hmm. uh, but the difference seems to be that it, it's going to be uh, rolled out to the general population rather faster. Constantine, I mean, when the Russians say that they are moving forward with uh, the, using uh, uh, the new vaccine without starting phase number three, I mean, this goes against the whole uh, culture that has been prevailing for decades in the scientific community. Well, uh, actually, if you look at the small print, you'll see that for general public, the vaccine not going to be released until sometime in 2021. Uh, so, in a way, it could well be that the claim for the registration of the vaccine is just essentially a declaration that the phase three trial will begin in earnest, which they will. There's somewhat a uh, disquieting uh, statement made that the vaccine will be offered to medics and also high school teachers in the, in the, in the fall. And this may be part of the phase three trials, which of course is not appropriate because this would be just a general population as opposed to being administered a vaccine they may not be able to say no to because they're all government employees. Maria, if this is politically mot motivated, uh, why, why make the announcement now? How significant is the moment? Well, uh, it is always uh, a good moment when you can say that uh, you are ahead of everybody else. And the fact that uh, President Putin himself made the announcement uh, apparently um, is supposed to sound even weightier and, uh, uh, and more important. Um, I would also point out that uh, President Putin mentioned that his daughter was already vaccinated with this vaccine, uh, which is noteworthy because Putin uh, usually refrains from mentioning his children. He's got two adult daughters. This time, too, he did not say which one of the two was vaccinated. However, uh, he only answers questions about his daughters, never ventures his own statements. And when he answers questions, he is very reluctant to talk about. However, I would say that uh, if he meant uh, to make his statement more credible, uh, this will not work this way in Russia because people would assume that what is accessible and available to a person as important as the present daughter will never be available to them. Derek, the Russians would tell you at the same time, because these are extraordinary times, extraordinary measures were taken. We're not going to wait for the first uh, phase, which is more about safety trials, the second one, which, more, which is more expanded, the third one, is, which is more about efficiency. We can combine uh, the phases as we move forward. Otherwise, you won't be able to have a vaccine anytime soon. You have to wait for at least two, three years. Normally, it would take several years to develop a vaccine. And uh, if we look back to the last pandemic that was a, a big news item back in 2016 when we had a Zika virus pandemic, uh, we still don't have a, a, a fully licensed uh, vaccine for Zika virus. And that, that's now coming on for almost four years now. So under normal circumstances, it can take a while to develop these things. 
Um, once again, with coronavirus, like, like with Zika virus, we, we've never had to develop a vaccine for humans for that particular group of, of um, viruses before. And Zika virus is a flavivirus, and the flaviviruses uh, are quite difficult to develop vaccines against. There are some good examples like yellow fever that, that have been developed and have been used for for quite some time with good results. Other flaviviruses where the, there haven't been such good results, things like dengue fever, for instance. Uh, among the coronaviruses, we similarly haven't really had much experience of trying to develop a vaccine for humans. We have some animal vaccines, but we, we've never before had a project like this where we've tried to develop a, a vaccine for this group of viruses for humans and in the context of such an international emergency. So the, the pressure, there's a lot of pressure all around the world to, to accelerate this process. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, in other countries, the, the vaccine development process is also um, being somewhat accelerated. So we, we have to be very careful about um, what, what the consequences might be and make sure that before we sign anything off, it's, it's been through all the appropriate clinical trial phases. And this is why um, the, the, the Russians should release their phase one and phase tri uh, two tri uh, clinical trial data uh, mm -hmm. as soon as possible so that scientists around the world can take a look at it. Constantine, epidemiologists all, all over the world from the leading authority in the United States of America, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the World Health Organization, have always cast some doubt about the capability of the Russians and the Chinese to manufacture a vaccine anytime soon, saying that they are not very transparent about all the data. Isn't this something that could further just compromise any attempt by the Russians to project themselves as the saviors of the world? Well, if you look at the history of this, for example, the polio vaccine was developed uh, at the same time in the Soviet Union as it was developed in the Salk Institute, right? So there's clearly precedent for Russians being at the forefront of, of some of this uh, research. Well, that having been said, during the last 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia clearly lost much of, the, of its power, including the manpower, which, uh, yes, does complicate the development. Maria, when you bring the world to this new narrative, which was which resemble what happened in the 50s and the 60s during the uh, Cold War. Isn't this something that could just undermine any chances in the near future to find a vaccine because everything becomes very political and every world leader is desperate to be shown as the one whose country has, uh, has found the, uh, the vaccine? Well, I'm not sure about everywhere uh, and about uh, everywhere this research being politicized. Um, uh, the Russian reaction to incredulity shown by uh, world experts uh, was that uh, they are unhappy about competition from Russia, uh, making it even more politicized. And I think uh, the, the only way to make it less political and more credible is to actually present to the world all the results that Russia has uh, received so far. Uh, actually, as I heard from some of the experts in Russia, was that... Um, uh, what has been made so far um, you know, in, in, uh, in terms of the vaccine is good enough for excellent publications in scientific magazines, in scientific journals, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, uh, for a political announcement, not for a broad public announcement that we are ready to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. And why uh, was it that instead of publishing and making themselves famous and congratulated, Russian scientists offered their result for political use? Is uh, anybody's Yes. Mm -hmm. let's, let, let's get now into the very heart of this whole debate about when a vaccine can be uh, produced. Uh, uh, Derek, there's been now uh, 165 vaccines uh, developed in different parts of the world. And so far, the most trusted, the one by Oxford University, shows that it can stimulate uh, 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 immune system. The other one in the United States of America shows that the patients, uh, it has triggered uh, uh, an immune uh, uh, response uh, among the patients. Isn't this something that the Russians themselves could also achieve if many, many, many laboratories all over the world have reached that benchmark? Yes, we, we would expect at the very least that the, the outcome of the phase two trial 
would be that the subjects that had received the vaccine as opposed to the placebo uh, would be generating antibodies uh, against the COVID-19 virus and that these would be uh, ideally neutralizing antibodies, meaning antibodies that in, in the laboratory can be used to deactivate the virus uh, and render it non-infectious. So the, the, the implication of finding the presence of neutralizing antibodies in a volunteer is that that volunteer would be immune to the to the infection at least for a for a while. Um, of course, it doesn't actually prove that they would be re resistant to infection in a natural setting because we don't know whether the presence of neutralizing antibodies alone would be enough. And that sort of thing can only really be determined by the phase three clinical trial where we vaccinate uh, some volunteers with a vaccine and uh, others receive a placebo, and then then we let them go about their general business. And after often after several months. Uh, they, they come back and we, we count effectively how many have, have suffered from an infection mm -hmm. and then the statisticians can get to work determining whether the virus, uh, the, the, the vaccine is statistically significantly protective. And, and that, that hasn't been achieved yet in any um, particular uh, vaccine trial at the moment. The best that we've got is that some vaccines have come out from phase two with demonstrable neutralising antibodies. So that, that's a sort of inferential um, evidence that mm -hmm. it might be protective, but it's not proof. Okay. Constantine, I mean, there is a divide e even among the, uh, the experts in, in, in Russia itself. The Gamalia Institute, credited by Putin for putting together the vaccine, has been one of the last institutes to step in worldwide when it comes to st launching the research and then starting the uh, the trials. And suddenly they say that they have managed to uh, uh, to fast track and get to this point. I mean, as a scientist, what is your concern about the announcement that was made about um, about the vaccine in Russia? First of all, I would like to say that. Truth to be told, there certainly are reports, but these reports are in Russian. So this is based on what Derek said, you know, in answering what Derek had said. And the report that has been presented certainly shows that there is uh, immunity in the volunteers who have been subjected to vaccination at stage one and stage two. So this milestone certainly has been reached. In terms of your question about the Gamaleya Institute being, you know, being coming late and all of a sudden coming to the forefront, so at least the official story is that they did uh, develop a much earlier vaccine for MERS, which is a coronavirus found actually in Saudi Arabia. And, but that's not a, such a big pandemic problem. It's, it's a local thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, what they have been doing is essentially uh, just substituting uh, a piece of the MERS gene, MERS virus gene, for the COVID gene in the already existing platform, a vaccine platform. And that certainly is much easier thing to do. So they claim they started doing their work as early as January when the first uh, genomic sequences of COVID became available. Maria, what happens next in Russia? Do you think that they will have, against the backdrop of the skepticism that has been expressed all over the world, they will have to give it more time, see the tri phase three, look into the results and then move forward with mass producing the vaccine? Well, of course, uh, it is very difficult to tell. Uh, I'm not sure uh, Russia has received the kind of reaction it, uh, it expected, uh, that instead of congratulations and maybe, uh, I don't know, envy, jealousy that Russia turned out to be ahead of everybody else, uh, what Russia uh, is getting these days, these, uh, since the announcement, uh, is a lot of incredulity and a lot of confusion and doubt. And uh, um, I would also consider how this will uh, affect the perception of Russians themselves. There is enough skepticism uh, as applies to uh, immunization in Russia. For instance, uh, last year, uh, almost 60% of people said they were not going to get vaccinated against flu. And in general, 23% of the Russian population uh, believe that vaccinations in general 
uh, are useless and uh, uh, some 11% believe that they are harmful. And mm -hmm. I wonder what will happen to this perception now when uh, so much doubts and suspicion and, uh, uh, and confusion has spread around. People in urban centers uh, tend to be even more skeptical in Russia. And this is where uh, there are, of course, higher concentrations of people and the likelihood of infection is the highest. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if these people now will feel even uh, uh, more reluctant to get uh, immunized. Derek, for our viewers who are waiting to see how desperate praying for a day when the vaccine would be uh, massively produced, which is safe and efficient. Throughout the, community, uh, the scientific community, there are three approaches. This is what people are doing at the laboratories. First of all, they are taking uh, the main strain of the virus, they disable it, and they use it for the trial. Some use the, uh, the sections of the genetic code into a harmless virus, and then they try it. The third one is when you take some raw pieces of the DNA and the RNA. And I assume that the World Health Organization is scrutinizing six main trials which are underway, hoping that one of them will hit the benchmark. How much time, infrastructure, this will take? Well, to, to get to the end of a, of a phase three trial uh, under normal circumstances would, would require a couple of years. Um, and then there would, there would need to be further trials beyond that to determine what, what the, really, the, the, the really rare side effects of the vaccine might be. But g given the, the level of political pressure around the world and the sense that this is a, is a global uh, emergency, it, it is likely that a, any vaccine that can be reasonably protective, even if it's not completely protective, of any vaccine that gets through a phase three clinical trial and shows that it does reduce the, the rate of infection and the vaccinated will, will probably get the go ahead for a wider rollout. That's simply because politicians uh, everywhere feel that the economic impacts of COVID as well as the medical ones and the social ones ha have been so enormous that if we can find a, a quick way out of this crisis by, by mass vaccination, then that, that, that's what they'll what they'll go for. Mm -hmm. And the problem with it with phase three trials under current circumstances, though, is that quite a lot of the world is still under lockdown, or partial or complete lockdown. And most places are observing social distancing if they can. So these are conditions where the, the, the transmission of the virus is being impeded by, by other actions that have been taken at societal level. Mm -hmm. So when, when we're assessing the evidence for a phase three trial, trying to decide whether the vaccine is protective or not, we, we have some difficulty determining whether those, those results are due to the vaccine or due to something else that's happening in society, like a lockdown or, or like the wearing of masks and social distancing and so on. So that, that mm. makes interpreting okay. phase three results extremely difficult. And um, that, that's the last thing we need at such a moment exactly. crisis. Exactly. Uh, Constantine, uh, Constantine, and this is why we need you to explain this more to our, uh, our viewers, uh, which is the, people are talking about phase three. And in phase three, this is where you give the vaccine to thousands of people across different groups, backgrounds and, uh, and age groups. And then you wait and see how many become infected compared with the volunteers who were given placebos. The FDA, for example, says it's only when 50 percent of those who were uh, given the, uh, the, the vaccine are protected that we can consider the vaccine to be effective and efficient. But at the same time, we have to wait and see for any side effects. The, the Russians decided to just move forward and say, you know what, we have the vaccine when phase three is the most critical phase at all. Well, again, I think it's important to actually read what has been announced. And uh, it has been announced that the uh, phase three trials with the Russian vaccine are starting well today, the next day after the announcement. Uh, it's not that I'm trying to defend them, but one idea is that to register a vaccine uh, is an important step to start producing it, including production for the uh, phase three trials, because it's not just the formulation of the vaccine, but even the site where a vaccine is to be produced that needs to be registered and improved. So in a way, what the Russians do, you can consider this if, if you try to be sympathetic, as trying to get a head start in this game where they will be conducting the phase three trials in parallel to amassing the production lines necessary should the trials be successful to produce more. Because like I said again, mm -hmm. the vaccine is not to be offered to general public until sometime in 2021. Okay. <laughs>